Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this webinar on the role of development cooperation in climate-related technology transfer. My name is uh, Jens Zedemund. I uh, lead the team in the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate working on climate change and environment. And we're very much looking forward to the discussion today. Um, we'll wait just uh, one more minute uh, or so uh, to uh, allow more people in the waiting room to go in. And so then we'll start with our, um, with our webinar. So welcome again. I think you know we've uh, given uh, one or two extra minutes before we start. Again, my name is Jens Lindemund, and I'll be your moderator today. And um, the topic we are discussing today is uh, climate-related technology transfer and the role that development cooperation plays in supporting um, the transfer of technologies uh, for climate change objectives to developing countries. And I'm uh, very pleased uh, that. Uh, we will be able to share with you uh, first in a presentation the findings of a report paper that is in the final stages of production will issue shortly and then we're looking forward to having a discussion that will be uh, started off uh, with two discussions um, one of them being mr christopher kaba who is uh, the technology needs assessment coordinator and national um, design, uh, national designated entity to the unfccc technology mechanism uh, from the environmental Protection Agency of Liberia. And uh, the uh, other discussant will be Michael Schneider, co-founder and CEO of Econex, uh, sort of a private sector um, for purpose, for profit, uh, and for impact uh, company uh, who have uh, uh, worked a lot on the issue. Now, um, before we start with the presentation, uh, I just would like to make a brief uh, introduction on the, uh, on the issue. And as I said, um, uh, the focus on technology um, transfer in the role of addressing climate change is only increasing. I think this was very much seen from the uh, events and discussions at the Glasgow COP. It's clearly been a key priority for developing countries. Uh, it's a recognized uh, need uh, by the donor community to up the game, so to speak, in supporting technology transfer, reflected in a recent declaration of uh, DAC members uh, um, in this regard. And it's also very clear from research, such as the IAA, which uh, identifies that um, for achieving uh, climate change objectives, many technologies still need to um, become more mature and need to be diffused very quickly, much more quickly than uh, would historically have been the case. But beyond that, it's, I think it's also important at the outset to say that technology transfer is central to the development of overall what's behind wealth creation and also behind offering solutions to problems from health to um, IT to engineering etc and it's always been keen I mean, if you start with the industrial revolution that was driven by technology uh, and uh, technology innovation basically succeeds where it offers a solution at a competitive price now um Technology transfer is obviously the essential mechanism for spreading the technology and the benefits from where it was invented to other places. And mostly it takes place through market mechanisms. Uh, again, if you have a better cost-effective solution addressing each of a problem to society, that's what will be picked up. And at the same time, that's very much complemented by the enabling environment created by public policies and support. Um, but at the same time, it's also very clear that historically it has been challenging to bring technologies quickly to developing countries through simple market mechanisms. And in fact, development cooperation and development finance um, have assumed a key role in helping transfer technology to countries where it does not work well through pure market dynamics. 
And that's true from the green revolution to uh, progress, for instance, on health and creating vaccines for ne neglected diseases. Again, to bring IT technology uh, uh, to developing countries, which then in some cases kickstarted uh, their own local in innovation and technology uh, drives in some countries. Again, development cooperation and finance has had a key role as a catalyst and enabler in this regard. Um, but I really don't want to keep you much longer here. And without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, my colleagues who will make the presentation for this joint work by the OECD with the UNEP-DTU and would like to hand over to Lakshmi Bamidipati, um, followed by Alberto Agnelli. So please, Lakshmi, over to you for the presentation. Thank you, Jens, and welcome everybody again. Uh, I'll be presenting the findings today on behalf of my colleagues at UNEP-DTU Partnership. Uh, in the center. I'll briefly again set the context, which I think Jens has already done a good job in uh, setting that context on how effective technology transfer is indispensable for climate mitigation and adapt adaptation. And the fact that technology plays a critical role in the economic growth and triggering longer term development pathways. Uh, and given this importance, um, and given the constraints to the transfer through market channels, technology transfer has been an inherent feature of development cooperation from its beginnings. And international support to technologies in the climate change context has been streamlined under the UN Climate Convention since 1992. Um, and as Jens mentioned, this report aims at highlighting the climate technology needs of the developing countries, drawing from the large TNA work and database, along with an analysis of development finance flows towards meeting this climate needs for the specific sectors within mitigation and adaptation and employing the OECD TAC data on development finance. And this presentation today is therefore a snapshot of our analysis and findings in the report. Next slide, please. Uh, before I move on to the technology needs of the countries, I'll take a few minutes to highlight some key points on the conceptual background of this topic on technology transfer. Uh, we know that there's a high variation in the generation and adoption, adoption rates of technologies. Uh, a relatively small number of high income and major emerging economies dominate the generation of new technologies. And as a consequence, most developing countries rely on the technologies developed in these countries to improve their productivity and meet their development needs. Uh, so their technological advances come through subsequent adoption of these uh, through technology transfer and thereby that reinforces how, if, how it's important to effectively promote and accelerate technology transfer. The further point to make here is that while majority of these technologies the transfer process takes place from developed to developing countries, it's no longer quasi exclusively characterized only by north south flows. Uh, and a select number of developing countries have been able to assume relatively advanced positions as well in manufacturing, production, and export of new technologies. Uh, markets in many developing countries can provide a much weaker and often insufficient incentive for technology generation, which can lead to market failures, uh, where targeted action by international development partners have helped in overcoming these. Next slide. Further, developing countries rely significantly on the uptake of uh, climate technologies to meet their objectives under mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and these technologies and the mitigation technologies are those that help in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, including the renewables such as wind and solar. Whereas climate adaptation technologies are those used to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change, whether it's early warning systems, flood control technologies, uh, to breeding of uh, drought resistant crops. Also, the same structural factors that inhibit technology transfer to developing countries are also closely related to fundamental challenges of developing countries that face uh, for their development. And these are further aggravated in the climate context, uh, given the sense of urgency as well. And some of these factors pertain to, you know, regulatory and policy settings, the high cost of and access to finance, uh, several capacity constraints, along with adaptation to local context. And all of these provide sufficient ground to bolstering support, whether in the form of uh, public measures, government support, national science and innovation policies, public funding, along with international uh, support through joint research programs, development aid, 
public initiatives and capacity building activities through UN and other international agencies. Next slide. We now briefly turn to these two critical avenues of international support. Uh, one, Development Cooperation Finance Flows, ODA, and the other being UN Climate Convention. International development cooperation is one of the key levers that developing countries can use to address bottlenecks that slow down the transfer of te climate technologies. Uh, specifically in this context, uh, development cooperation, the understanding of technology transfer within development cooperation has also evolved from direct financing support to more holistic ways of support through the enabling environment. Uh, they have also been providing technical assistance, capacity building support to domestic institutions, uh, providing support to the governments on streamlining national policies and regulatory frameworks. And beyond these soft interventions, development banks and DFIs have also been supporting direct uh, providing financing support, which my colleague Alberto will also elaborate further on it later. But one thing we note also is that the development agencies seem to also lack uh, more targeted and holistic strategies and mechanisms to support technology transfer at the country level, as well as to identify and effectively respond to countries' specific technology needs. And on that note, it's relevant to also turn to the UN Climate Convention. Under the convention, since 1992, countries have long highlighted the role of technology in facilitating the achievement of uh, respective development goals. And at COP7, the technology needs assessment or TNAs were introduced as a way to countries, as a way for developing countries to identify and determine their specific technology priorities for adaptation and mitigation. Further in 2010, the technology mechanism was established to accelerate and enhance uh, climate technology development and transfer uh, with the policy arm being the TEC and implementation arm being the CTCN. In addition, the UNFCCC also comprises of both technology and financial mechanisms, uh, and they've sought for long to also synergize these activities and drive more joint efforts. We include a summary of these initiatives and their progress so far, ever since they've been established, more in the report. And in addition, for the next few, few slides, we zoom into the TNAs and the technology needs assessment to understand better how uh, developing countries have been prioritizing their technologies under mitigation and adaptation. Next slide, please. Uh, TNAs are a set of activities that identify and analyze uh, mitigation and adaptation technology priorities of developing countries. Uh, the TNA project is being implemented by UNEP and UNEP-DT partnership on behalf of the Global Environment Facility. The process is a highly country-driven one with a national TNA coordinator and a set of national consultants leading the process uh, from the beginning of identifying and prioritization of technologies to identifying the barriers that inhibit further uptake, followed by a more concrete technology action plan where specific project ideas and concept nodes are evolved. And also synergies are drawn with other national processes and programs underway at the national level, along with that also ties with the implementation of NDCs at the country level. A key challenge to quickly note in the entire process is that developing countries, uh, for developing countries is to be able to identify the most suitable technology, but also the specific scale at which to operate and the specific sizes and the market segments within the technologies given the local context and also the changing climate conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give a brief uh, geographical representation of where TNAs have been conducted so far in nearly 100 developing countries, including the TNA phase four, which is currently underway. Um, and we've used the uh, database so far to also, do the to also do the analysis in the report and also sharing the findings in the next few slides. Next one, please. So building on the data derived from the developing countries self reported climate technology needs through the TNAs. Uh, these next few slides provide an overview of the sectors but and also the type of technologies that they have uh, prioritized within mitigation and adaptation. And this data is extracted from TNA reports completed during the last decade from 2011 to 2020 and includes information from 79 countries on their key priorities, sectors and technologies. 
So as you can see within adaptation, the most prioritized sectors are agriculture and water with almost 87% of the countries um, highlighting it as an important one, followed by agriculture, sorry, followed by the coastal zone, uh, also highlighted by 31% of the countries, further followed by 14% for forestry and natural resources. While for mitigation, countries have prioritized energy, transport, 95% um, of the countries have prioritized energy sector, followed by 33% for the transport sector and 20% for the waste um, and waste management and forestry sector, and a lesser proportion for agriculture at 15%. So just to give an overview of the different sectors prioritized under adaptation and mitigation by the 79 developing countries. Moving on, next slide. Further zooming within the sectoral level, zooming into the technology level, in the TNA process countries prioritize technologies based on a range of criteria that reflects economic, social, environmental impacts, and hence the prioritized technologies are not only based on only climate change mitigation and adaptation potential. Um, as you could see from the, within the adaptation, um, within the agriculture sector as an example the, the the most prioritized technologies are to do with crop diversification new crop varieties um, including introduction of climate resilient crops uh, and also drip irrigation water catchment and within the mitigation sector we look at an example from the energy where solar buildings and lighting systems and bioenergy. And we just use examples from two sectors, but the same uh, level of data is also available for all of these sectors within the adaptation and mitigation. And this again give to snap, this is again to give a snapshot of the technologies that are being prioritized by various developing countries. Next slide, please. To just pause a little bit and also to highlight that a compounding factor in case of uptake of climate technologies and technology transfer also links back to the technology cycle and the maturity of the technologies. Uh, technologies um, are also understood to follow a technology life cycle, following from the very nascent research and demonstration phase to an initial deployment phase to a more mature phase where they're deployed more widely, followed by a decline when their competitiveness reduces uh, and other technologies emerge. Why this is important is that it's not a linear process and the feedback between market experiences and further technological development are especially important, uh, including in many prospective technologies also not making it to market, mat market or maturity at all. Um, so key point here is that the market development and technology development go more or less hand in hand and technologies are typically more costly at the outset but usually become more cost effective over time if they're widely disseminated and a market begins to develop the cost evolution of technologies over this life cycle has particular relevance for developing countries and the, and in the climate change context given how new technologies are often not affordable climate technologies in terms of their maturity and try to categorize in these three categories of traditional, modern, and high. And for this, we conducted a classification of all of the technologies reported by an iterative process whereby we it took inspiration from the approach of UNFCCC along with other related technology classifications in the literature and modified it based on the TNA database and the feedback that we've also received from the stakeholders over time in these different developing countries. Why this is important is that what it basically highlights is that there is different stages of development. So for instance, the more nascent or the high technologies, the, the implication in terms of challenges lie mainly in the research and demonstration, whereas the modern technologies or the widely diffused already, the challenges of developing countries also diffused both in developed and de developing contexts, 
continue the uptake of their these technologies continue to be inhibited by non-financial challenges uh, for instance resource constraints or governance and we also highlighted a few examples that fall into these different categories um, yeah and we use this categorization also to do some more analysis which follow in the next few slides so if we move to the next slide please so in this, we see, for instance, within the adaptation sector, um, water sector is where the highest share of the more widely developed or modern technologies lies. And overall, there's still a lower uh, proportion of the high technologies or the more nascent technologies, particularly in agriculture, water, and coastal zone. Um, but a majority of the identified technology gaps then are within the category of the modern technologies. And that's the one that's highlighted in orange, which means the uptake of these technologies is inhibited mainly by the financial challenges. Next slide, please. And we do the same analysis for the mitigation sector and find quite different kinds of uh, proportions with energy, sector having majority of the modern technologies which are also widely diffused and relatively fewer nascent technology proportion um, and transport sector as well but there's still a higher proportion of the new and emerging technologies almost 30 percent and above so that does highlight uh, something about where the challenges lie as well which is also to do with the research and demonstration as we highlighted in the previous slide um, but for the others for instance forestry manage waste management and agriculture you could see the proportion of the traditional technologies are the highest which also means that the, the uptake of these technologies are um, challenged perhaps by the non-financial um, challenges Moving go on, next slide, please. So drawing on this uh, DNA data and the analysis, we find that developing countries face a whole host of challenges inhibiting the transfer of climate technologies as also identified by the stakeholders themselves, which is what is identified, represented in this figure. So 90% of the technologies prioritized by the countries during the DNA process are reported to be inhibited on economic and financial aspects primarily um, and these refer to high initial cost of technologies difficulties in obtaining loans uncertainties regarding returns on investment and a general lack of financial resources the second most highly reported challenge is also to do with the regulatory frameworks which could mean insufficient um, regulatory frameworks, highly controlled sector, political instability, bureaucracy. Um, and yeah, so these challenges highlight a need for specific improvements and interventions that can be sought in these uh, areas of challenges. Uh, with also, there is a slight differentiation across income groups and regions when it comes to the type of challenges that are being reported. Uh, but one thing to say is that the economic and financial challenges still continue to remain common across all regions and across different income groups. Um, but for instance, within the, um, the small um, develop, island developing states and within the LDCs, the categories also to do with the institutional and organizational challenges, human skills, social, cultural and behavioral aspects also feature quite strongly. And based on the evidence from TNAs and the technology action plans, both in terms of uh, priorities as well as challenges, it does seem that many of the technologies that we are referring to as also uh, highlighted in the previous slides are already widely available. They are less to do with the very nascent technologies. So what's important here is how to accelerate the ones that are already available, whether it's reducing the financial challenges or bringing in specific interventions um, and, and governments can facilitate the flow of technologies within the countries using measures such as incentives, uh, streamlining regulations, local institutions. And as noted by UNFCCC, the development and transfer 
of technologies are come mainly in the context of implementation of projects and programs and main source of financing for this also comes from uh, development aid. And on this note, I now turn to my colleague Alberto to dive deeper into development financial flows and how they support the prioritized climate technologies. Thank you. Over to you, Alberto. Yes, thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, so uh, uh, after taking a look at the tech needs uh, that were reported by developing countries, the second part of the presentation uh, will uh, briefly touch upon the role of development and cooperation in facilitating uh, climate technology transfer in developing countries. Uh, to start off with this second section, uh, I think it, it is worth mentioning that tech transfer uh, has inherently been a core feature of development cooperation, uh, from supporting new agricultural techniques and the green revolution to microfinance to advancing market commitments uh, for neglected disease vaccines. Uh, this, set, this, set, this presentation uh, specifically focuses on climate-related technologies for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, development cooperation is really one of the levers uh, that developing countries can use to address uh, the bottlenecks that were uh, mentioned before uh, that slow down the transfer of climate technologies. Uh, and dev development cooperation can do so uh, by providing the additional resources and capabilities uh, to address structural, institutional, and financial constraints uh, that challenge uh, the smooth transfer of these technology, technologies and, and then resulting in persistent underinvestment in and low take up of uh, many technologies. Uh, so basically in the paper, uh, we identify five main instruments or modalities uh, through which development cooperation can support this process. Uh, first, uh, dev development cooperation can provide uh, technical assistance and capacity building uh, to support domestic institutions, national governments, and the private sector uh, to equip them uh, with the right capabilities to be able to absorb and successfully deploy uh, new technologies. Uh, providers of development cooperation can, for example, provide funds for vocational education and training and establish a knowledge exchange platforms and partnership between research centers and universities. Uh, an example of this, for instance, is represented by the German Climate Technology Initiative, uh, which supports the establishment of vocational training centers uh, specializing in the field of renewable energy in Morocco. Uh, second, uh, we have, uh, you know, to support policy reform and more conducive regulatory environments, development cooperation providers regularly work with developing countries' government on enhancing uh, national policies, regulatory frameworks, and innovation systems. Uh, this includes initiatives to inform uh, the adoption of new policies and regulations, ideas, and knowledge uh, to support the policy making process uh, and to identify uh, reforms to regulations and governance frameworks. Uh, for example, uh, French IFD and the European Union through the African Renewable Energy Scale Up Facility. Uh, provide technical assistance to strengthen um, uh, regulatory and institutional framework in several African countries uh, to support project preparation of renewable energy initiatives. Uh, third, uh, we move to uh, you know, the most traditional way of supporting tech transfer uh, that it goes beyond this soft intervention we've just talked about and that uh, is through direct financing. So development banks and development finance institutions often, often directly finance uh, hard technology transfer uh, by providing direct support to the transfer and deployment of specific technologies. Uh, the provision of financing at concessional terms is a key asset, asset for the ability to provide longer, longer term finance uh, for infrastructure financing uh, and for testing and demonstration to scale up uh, for of various technologies uh, across sectors and geographies where these technologies were not previously deployed. Uh, then fourth uh, and fifth, we move a little more towards the private sector. Uh, so we know that for its potential to scale up resources for development, uh, private sector engagement and catalyzation has risen as a top priority in the development cooperation agenda. Uh, and blended finance, for instance, is one tool donors uh, use to scale up investment in climate technologies by catalyzing private sector capital through a variety of financial instruments, 
that are really structured to reduce and manage risks uh, of investing in specific uh, technologies and infrastructures in developing countries. Uh, finally, uh, development agencies have in the past also engaged with their own private sector domestically to encourage firms to favor technology transfer through their investment in developing countries. Uh, to do so, countries use a variety of policy tools uh, through their expert credit agencies, uh, such as financing for uh, licensing of particular technologies to firms in developing countries, uh, to incentives for firms that engage in technology transfer and training in developing countries, and uh, through private uh, public partnerships. Uh, now, uh, I will just move um, to uh, the, the second original contribution of this paper, which regards the quantification of development finance flows in support of climate-related technology transfer. So uh, in the first slide, we saw what are the main instruments, and now we see what financial flows are attached to them. Uh, first of all, let's characterize the flows that we are talking about. So development finance constitutes the vast majority of international climate finance flowing to developing countries. And the sources of this finance include both official development assistance, so ODA, and other flows uh, that while being concessional and still below market terms do not qualify as ODA, but are nonetheless very important sources uh, of finance in developing countries. Uh, as you can see in the graph, the blue bars represent ODA and the green bars uh, other development finance flows not qualifying as ODA. Uh, and this is all climate related development finance, uh, you know, going to develop, developing countries from 2013 to 2019. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this has uh, con consistently grown. And in 2019, there were US dollars 78.6 billion in official development finance to developing countries for climate related uh, purposes. And this was up 10% from 2018. Uh, so moving, uh, moving on, um, out of these resources, so climate related development finance that we looked at in the previous slide, uh, what we tried to do was to quantify uh, the, uh, the part of it that was actually supporting tech transfer uh, in developing countries. To do so, uh, we use a methodology that exploits the descriptive information that is included in a, in a database we have at the OECD that is called the OECD Climate Related Development Finance Database, which is based on a self-reporting by donors, both bilaterals and multilaterals. And then we applied on this descriptive information a keyword search uh, uh, that were based on specific climate technologies uh, related words. Uh, what we find is that in 2015, 2019, an average of tw uh, uh, approximately 21 billion per year of official development finance targeted climate tech transfer. And this represents 32% of total resources for climate, uh, climate related. Uh, over the same period, the increase in resources was clear and moved from 13.3 billion, as you can see in the green bars, in 2015, uh, to almost uh, 29 billion in 2019. And this growth also outpaced total growth in climate-related development finance, and this can be seen uh, in the orange uh, dots. Uh, where you can see that uh, uh, the percentage of climate related development finance that uh, supported technology transfer uh, moved from 27% in 2015 to 36% uh, in 2019. Then what, what we looked at is the key sectors and regions in climate related tech transfer. Uh, so while development finance is increasingly uh, focusing on climate technology transfer, as we saw in the previous slides, slides uh, its sectorial and geographical focus is still very narrow. So across sector, mitigation is disproportion disproportionately targeted. So we find that 69% uh, of uh, flows for uh, technology, climate-related technology transfer is for adaptation when compared to, to 20% for uh, adaptation. Then there is another 11% that is cross-cutting between mitigation and adaptation. Uh, both, by, as you can see in the graph, and that's very clear from the first bar, both bilateral and multilateral providers focus the majority of their resources on the energy sector, uh, followed by transport uh, and agriculture. Uh, energy and transport projects, uh, as you know, often require a large upfront investment, uh, and this is often allocated as concessional loans, 
and therefore it drives up allocation for these sectors. Uh, energy is overall a priority area, as we saw in Lakshmi presentation before, for 95% of countries which reported through TNAs. Uh, and the role of development cooperation in this area is really to address issues related to technical and regulatory risk, as well as financial vi viability. And uh, for the energy sector, uh, we find that up, on average, uh, there is 8.9 billion a year, or 53% of the total uh, that was allocated uh, for in the energy sector uh, over the period 2015-2019. The majority of these resources were for infrastructure for energy generation, while 11% uh, of these resources went for energy policy, so really improving the enabling environment to transfer technologies in the energy sector. Uh, then moving to the distribution, in our analysis we find a difference in sectoral allocation depending on countries' income groups, with agriculture in LDCs representing 16% of total resources, while only 4% in upper middle in income countries, reflecting, of course, the economic structure of countries belonging to different income groups. Uh, lower middle income countries received the largest share of resources for climate related technology transfer, so 47%, while LDCs received the least, uh, 17%. Uh, then, in terms of geographical focus, climate tech transfer flows uh, disproportionately, disproportionately uh, towards Asia, while under-targeting Asia. So you can see that Asia received 56% of total resources, while Africa only receives 22%. And this is true, of course, in absolute terms, as you can see here, but also when we compare this uh, you know, with, with the share uh, of total uh, development finance resources flowing to this uh, to this uh, two regions. So Africa should be much higher uh, if, if it received uh, the same resources it receives as development finance, uh, while here we see that it's under targeted in terms of technology transfer flows. Um, then uh, 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 when we look uh, finally at key finance, financial instruments that are used uh, for tech transfer, uh, we find that debt instruments are by far the most used financial instruments. So 68% of total resources dispersed for, this, for technology transfer uh, of climate technologies uh, were in the form of debt instruments. And these are followed by grants that represent 30% and equity investment that represents 2%. Uh, and then when we look into these uh, financial instruments, we find that 85% uh, of activities financed through loans uh, targeted mitigation, uh, mitigation activities. So loans mainly finance mitigation activities. Uh, on the other hand, grants are more equally distributed. Uh, we find that 59% of grants still targets mitigation activities, 41% targets adaptation activities. And then there is a 14% that targets both objectives. Uh, then, of course, even the sectorial uh, breakdown of uh, financial instruments is, shows some interesting findings where we see that the energy sector's financing happens mainly in the form of concessional loans, while agriculture is uh, primarily financed through grants. So 57% uh, of uh, technology transfer in agriculture is financed through grants. So this is like our uh, last slides and uh, refers to the outlooks and priorities for development cooperation and climate technology transfer. Uh, so some of the priorities, of course, are, are to address the bottlenecks to mature technologies adoption, uh, as, uh, as Lakshmi mentioned. And these are, for example, regulatory or policy shortcomings, as well as access to and costs of finance. Uh, then the second uh, priority for development cooperation is to accelerate the deployment of emerging technologies. And these, in this uh, area, regulatory and policy settings are equally central, uh, enhancing the affordability of this technology and mitigating risk for private investment is as well a key aspect uh, of, this, of this area. Uh, and finally, strengthening institutional, institutional and human capacity is the final uh, you know, priority uh, in this area. Uh, the third point is really in line with the TNAs, there should be an increased support for diffusion, of, for diffusion and transfer of adaptation technologies. As we saw, uh, the majority of, the, of development cooperation really focus on, on mitigation and the, 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 the largest amounts of financial flows really goes towards mitigation technologies. 
To do so, uh, what is probably needed are, are some metrics uh, to measure adaptation outcomes that maybe in the, in the mitigation sphere are uh, more developed. And finally, and this is something that we noticed not just from the data analysis, but also uh, from interviews that we had uh, with, with donors, uh, there should be a more strategic approach by development agencies. Uh, so as we saw, while in the UN context, the centrality of international support to developing countries for tech transfer was formally recognized in 1992, funding for these activities seems to still not follow a programmatic approach. Uh, the interplay between all the different aspects we talked about, so regulatory capacity and finance, requires, uh, uh, requires uh, an important uh, role for programmatic approaches to technology transfer. And the two main problems here uh, are, first of all, the institutional capacity constraints within development institutions themselves. And this invariably pose limitation to the ability to develop a deep understanding of climate technologies within development agencies and their opportunities to deploy them and transfer them across sectors. So uh, to solve this issue, clearly more synergies are needed uh, uh, in, in this sphere. And finally, uh, there, is, there is another aspect, there is institutional policies seems to be slow uh, to react to a rapidly evolving technological uh, uh, area. Um, so we know that updating institutional policies with regard to technologies typically happen only periodically in development agencies. And this approach does not reflect really a prior, prior, prioritization of accelerated uh, technology transfer. And, the, and this shortcoming will need to be addressed uh, if we want to accelerate uh, technology transfer of climate technologies to developing countries. Uh, so this, this was pretty much uh, the, the content of our paper. Uh, and uh, we thank you uh, for your attention. And now uh, back to Jens for, for the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi and, and Alberto. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce again our two discussions that we have. One from the perspective, I think, of a developing country that is uh, obviously keenly interested in, in transferring technology and the other from sort of a private sector provider of, of a technology uh, and their experience with the transfer and I guess the support also from the international community and international development corporation. So with that, I'm very pleased to uh, first call Mr. Uh, Christopher Kaba, the uh, TNA coordinator and national designated entity to the UNFCCC Technology Mechanism and uh, the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia. Please, Christopher, um, we're looking forward to your intervention. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you so much for this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, thank you. Okay, uh, we always have some internet uh, connection problems. But let me say thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, platform. Uh, let me also extend my appreciation, especially to the team uh, from UDP. They have been very, very, you know, hardworking in ensuring that uh, the development of technologies from uh, developing countries are not just being assessed, but also, you know, finding ways how to implement these technologies. So in the case of Liberia, uh, we started already the TNA process. We, as you may be aware, the TNA process, the assessment of the technologies requires to go through uh, three stages. Uh, the first stage is the identification and also prioritizations of technologies. And then we'll move up to the barrier analysis that has to do with market analysis of these technologies. And also then we'll do what we call the top technology action plans. So currently Liberia, we have done our prioritizations of the technologies. We have done the barrier analysis. And now we are currently at the concluding stage wherein we are now developing our technology action plans. So one of the key things that we did, we looked at uh, areas that are vulnerable to the country and we look at, you know, uh, uh, national processes, documents that have been produced, such as the NDC and other, you know, national uh, processes that are ongoing. 
we look at all of them, and then uh, we decided to, you know, to dis, uh, to 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 select uh, vulnerable sectors. So, in the case of Liberia, we selected uh, the agriculture and the coastal areas because these are the major sectors that are really, really vulnerable when it comes to the impacts of climate change. They are felt everywhere. You know that uh, one of the key reasons why we selected the coastal area because Liberia lies. Uh, within the coastal belt, nine of our uh, cities are, you know, bounded with the coastal areas. And if you look at most of the reports being produced from Liberia, it shows that uh, the the oceans is actually, you know, undermining the gains of our of our shores. So uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, life lost and properties especially you know, in uh, uh, shelter villages and towns along the coast, coastal areas, as well as our cities. So we, we, we selected that particular area to do our assessment of technology and also the agriculture under uh, uh, adaptations. Then the mitigations, we selected the energy area, uh, the energy sector as one of the key uh, components. If you look at the NDC that has been produced from Liberia, even the current reverse NDCs shows that uh, most of our our problem, our mitigation problems, and also you know uh, our problem as you relate to you know uh, emitting a lot of uh, carbon in the air comes from the mitigations. We rely on private generators, diesel generators uh, to run offices and also use for our homes. So the mitigation sector especially when it comes to the energy area, is a serious challenge. And you know that Liberia is a forested country. Uh, we also rely uh, greatly on uh, biomass in the form of uh, charcoal uh, to, you know, to cook uh, in our homes and so forth. So that clearly shows that, and that is actually happening with uh, uh, deforestation. So there is a huge percent of, you know, deforestation that is ongoing in the country because of the use of charcoal. So given all of these backgrounds, we decided to assess technologies in these uh, three sectors. And uh, if you look at the reports for the agriculture sector, you realize that uh, key areas that we think uh, that require interventions is the value additions on agricultural products. We also uh, selected the improved storage uh, facility that is uh, which it will help us to dry and freeze our agricultural products. Our country is really blessed. Uh, we produce a lot of vegetables, but our problem is also storage in this context. So uh, stakeholders that were invited, they decided that you know this is really important. There is a need that you know uh, people should come in to support us in in this context. And we we'll also, you know, selected, you know, integrated fertility management, uh, irrigations, ecological pest management, mixed farming methods, and all of that as uh, technologies that we'll be able to use to address uh, the challenges that we we'll face in agriculture area. So for the coastal area, uh, one of the top uh, priorities is the integrated coastal zone management system. We need to have that as a as stand. We do not have uh, any uh, management. Uh, uh, zones when it comes to coastal areas, and we do not also have uh, the integrated one. So we said that we need to have the integrated coastal zone management system in place. And then uh, top on the priority is the uh, flood early warning system. We know that our country is not too open to these kind of a technologies, but uh, stakeholders said that it is important that we have these kind of technologies that will be able to to at least inform us ahead of time, ahead of time, so that people in these uh, uh, coastal areas will, will 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 prepare to you know to probably you know migrate just in case if there is a high level sea rise. And rock and uh, armor revetments is also uh, one of the key uh, technologies that we need. We we also you know one of the key technologies that I would like to make mentions of is the the restorations of the coastal vegetations, uh, wherein it's a traditional method that uh, is widely used in Liberia here. Uh, we have had a few successes in that. 
where we planted coconut trees along the, 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 the oceans, you know, to protect the sea for coming in water. You know, and that has been successful in a few other cities. Uh, if you look at one of the cities called Maryland County, you know, Harper, Harper is, is, is being helped in this regard. we we'll manage to save Harper because of, you know, the plenty of coconut trees. But our country is still in doubt with so many of these challenges. Uh, that and one of the key reasons why um, uh, we're facing challenges of, of, of such is because of financial, you know, uh, problems. We we have our priority areas, and we have a report to these priority areas, and we are looking for funding to be able to implement uh, various technologies and methods that we think we'll be able to use to address uh, these challenges. So I will just go to the mitigation sector uh, when it comes to energy. We 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 highlighted uh, a solar solar home uh, PV system, solar PV grid tie and uh, solar latrine biodigester, and also small hydro plants. You know we also want to uh, concentrate on biodigester and also improve on clean coal stove, you know, and solar uh, dryers, which it will help our country greatly to be able to to also, you know, uh, reduce the impacts of climate change in the mitigations area. And not only uh, uh, the mitigation area, but it will help to also promote uh, livelihood uh, for our, our domestic women, because right now, one of the key uh, thing that, you know, we want to do is, is to train the market women how to produce how to produce, you know, cook stove, and even how to produce biodigesters, so that it reduce pressure. It reduce pressure on our forest. Our forest is is being undermined every single day, and the EPA and also the FDA, who are who are in the business of, you know, protecting our forest, uh, do not have the 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 Require, uh, how can I say, the required uh, uh, strength uh, that include financial strength and also, you know, capacity to be able to, you know, to to seize control over issues of such. So um, we we greatly greatly need this, and gladly the TNA process is very a key one, and our country took the TNA process into serious considerations during the NDC revision process. So if you look at the NDC, we, you realize that, you know, uh, the, the, the issues of, you know, of, 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 of all of what I've highlighted are all being captured in the NDCs. And if you look at our NDC, you realize that uh, we have conditional uh, targets and we have, you know, unconditional targets. And if you look at the conditional target, we even uh, place that at 25% uh, uh, in terms of support that our country will be able to provide towards implementations of the NDC. And the unconditional target is placed at uh, 85. So that shows that we need, we need uh, serious financial, we need serious financial uh, supports uh, towards the implementations of our NDCs and also uh, 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 the the implementations of you know of the identified technologies in these areas. Uh, one of the key things I would like to say: the TNA process did not just emerge uh, from our offices at the EPA or the Ministry of Mines and Energy or the Ministry of Agriculture. We invited stakeholders to this uh, assessment process. Uh, they were involved at every stage uh, throughout the. The assessment process, and we did site visitations. And when I say stakeholders, uh, that includes our country. They were all they were all involved in the process, and they they were privileged to decide on what is required to be used as technology. In fact, 
they were the one that was suggesting these technologies that we just uh, named here, that these technologies would have to address uh, some of the problems that we have in the country. So uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, I'm in a very noisy background, but I hope uh, the message is across. In terms of coordinations, uh, synergies between uh, line ministries is very good, is very cordial. We are all moving on the same uh, uh, directions. Our government, especially our president, uh, have stated over and over that uh, he's willing to put all of his strength into the protections of our environment and also addressing climate change. We've had uh, two successful national dialogue on the issues of climate change and also had one of the successful you know, uh, national conference when it comes to climate change, where the president attended as well as his cabinet ministers and also, you know, the legislatures, they were all there and they committed to this. We even allowed them to sign an MOU in terms of, you know, providing support towards the protections of our environment and also ensuring that, you know, policies and laws are uh, made uh, in terms of, you know, enhancing our own ability to, you know, to protect the environment is being maintained. So gladly that, you know, he's willing to provide support and he was in Glasgow. He made a very insightful you know, statement there uh, in support of the environment and his willingness to work with all of the partners who are in the business of, you know, of protecting the environment. So on this note, I want to say thank you and thank you to everyone. I look forward to suggestions, questions that maybe will be relevant for us to, you know, to address. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Christopher, for this uh, for this you know, very rich intervention. And I mean, I think you very clearly brought out, you know, the the centrality of the technology needs, uh, you know, the, the priority areas, but they're you know they exist in many areas, and they're very much critical to your broader development objectives, um, as you said, you know, uh, adding uh, value in agriculture, etc. And then also for stressing the the how the TNA process is really instrumental in identifying these priorities and moving forward and closely linked to the NDCs and ambition. Now, with that, I would like to you know shift a bit to, to our second discussion with a different perspective. And, and Michael Schneider, he's a co-founder and co-CEO of Econext, and Econext builds uh, companies for profit but with impact and with a focus on addressing significant social and environmental challenges. And um, in that context, also, um, you know, there's a significant focus on doing that uh, in developing countries, and uh, I think a good amount of experience in working with donors and DFIs. So, um, Michael, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jens. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Um, can I screen share? Is that an option, Jens, or am I uh, overrunning yes. the, the capability? Yes, that's good. So let's, let's see what I can uh, at least pull up one um slide um can you see this it's coming up yes so just to to get us in the mood um but christopher just said uh, from the liberian perspective there's two things happening here this is in hamburg and i'll speak about that in a moment but what's produced here christopher is uh, bio charcoal um, and I'll talk about that a bit uh, on the micro uh, economic levels in a moment. And I would like to use that example of a classic technology transfer um, to also talk a bit about what Jens was saying, uh, my DFI and uh, ODA finance background. I used to run uh, a whole variety of uh, blended finance vehicles. We financed uh, irrigation systems in Zambia, cocoa um, in, in Sierra Leone and smallholder farmers in cotton in northern Ghana. So that's a bit of my background. That's why I'm uh, friendly with the OECD for many years. And I left that sector of the development finance world to provide more actual projects. I was a bit, uh, my weakness is a bit the impatience. And we, we were sitting on these blended finance vehicles and didn't have enough good technology transfer, renewables, mit mitigation, adaptation projects to lend to. Uh, that is also, um, also I think Lakshmi and uh, Alberto already mentioned, uh, maybe a first quick hint, 
debt or loans is not always the best. Huh? We have we've seen it in Alberto's chart. It's, it's dominating, but it's not really triggering the technology transfer. Because the risk is a bit higher. And I think you brilliantly put that out on the slides. So that will be, I'll summarize it a bit later. One of my key asks is uh, be more courageous in supporting equity. And other uh, financial models, for example, blends that may not happen otherwise. So you really, really be incremental and additional uh, in from a donor's perspective. From uh, uh, again Christopher's perspective, um, uh, Liberia or many West African nations are involved in cocoa. So this, uh, by way of a bit further background, uh, project in Hamburg is a cocoa project. It just happens to be in Hamburg, which is, I believe, another one of the problems. Often. Uh, the developed nations are trying stuff that is really, really cool out first in their home nations. Maybe it's a bit of a of a uh, understanding that we should try it here first and not immediately deploy it uh, in the ODA countries. I would tend to disagree with that. I think we have shown in, in East Africa how mobile phones uh, can be used for many, many fantastic applications and Germany is still behind on that, to be quite honest. <laughs> you, you probably many of you will, will be able to confirm. So I see huge opportunity to do the same thing with technology transfer. Uh, and if you look at, uh, from a macro level, fossil fuel energy systems, oftentimes um, least developed countries or SITs have a fantastic opportunity to leapfrog. They shouldn't build the old fashioned energy system. They can build decentralized systems with new technologies not necessarily new innovations. We don't need to build research and development centers. We have everything we need in place to deploy as the private sector, as donors, and as DFIs, quote, in the middle. So this um, factory, just to, to uh, use a bit the impression here, it's often good to have an example. So in this big uh, uh, piece of equipment here uh, is when you make biochar, there is a synth gas and that syngas is a biogas so again you can use it for energy production it's entirely green this one will decarbonize the largest chocolate factory in the world yum yum uh, by 70 to 80 percent and this is just literally a waste product of a process that's called pyrolysis has been known to humankind for many many years so again not an innovation just a application a, a let's say a confident application of an existing technology, in, in this case, in Hamburg. I'm a bit disappointed because we all know 70% of the world's cocoa is uh, sourced in West Africa. So this should be in Accra or in Abidjan uh, or in places in Cameroon. Um, it's not yet. So to, use, to continue, continue using that example, now imagine what Christopher said. Uh, you may need energy systems to, you know, produce heat for cooking. You don't need to get rid of the rainforest. Right? With, with an example like this, from agricultural waste, you would have biogas that you can use for heat production. This heat is hot enough even to uh, produce chocolate, right? an entire factory for the largest in the world. So why wouldn't we be able to use that uh, for heat production? Now you will say, well, cook stoves are less central than a, a chocolate factory. Correct, but biochar, again, even if you burned it later on, it would be made from agricultural waste, from processing. So again, it's much better than deforestation and it's a carbon sink. So I'm, st I'm still sticking a bit in the, in the macro and micro dialogue. From a macro perspective now, Liberia or another West African nation could say, hey guys, uh, remember article six, remember the carbon market, remember our national determined contributions, this will pay into that because now a private sector investor would say, I shouldn't be double counting. Um, this will use agriculture, uh, maybe cook stove uh, coal or charcoal by organically sourced bio waste charcoal. And again, some of the waste uh, is heat made from this syngas, so-called syngas. Uh, and we should mention what I just said, uh, the third stream of income is not just the NDC uh, recognition, but maybe at some point 
uh, some kind of a local or regional market in these certificates, right? So biochar um, is not just a carbon sink for these certificates, but in the next uh, fact, it also is not only mentioned in the IPCC reports all over the place, it's a nature-based solution and it happens to store a lot of water. Uh, depending on what you make it from, in this case, from cocoa shells, it stores up to three times its own weight in water. And uh, for the agronomists amongst us, I'm not one, I'm just pretending, uh, it also helps exchanging what they call the cations. So it's, it's negatively charged surface attracts nutrients in soil. So Christopher, it really resonated what you said. Vegetables, for example, they love it. Or rainforests, if you wanna do seedlings huh, and rebuild rainforests, the biomass accretion or, or improvement is again helped by your own biochar from your own waste products. And you can rebuild quicker and faster and then again have a better carbon sink uh, through photosynthesis. So just by, by something that we didn't invent, maybe none of us invented, pyrolysis, um, bio waste from agricultural activities that happen anyways, you have these two prong uh, innovations that would just need a technology transfer and a more long-term view on how you use and how you um, organize agricultural supply chains. And in this case, uh, Christopher, I think the next uh, big ask uh, all of us would have is why is in this case Barry Kalebaut, the largest processor in the world, Yes, they are looking into uh, doing it in Ivory Coast. Um, they tested it in Hamburg in their largest factory. So kudos to them. But we all probably, probably want them to request a similar solution in the other growing regions uh, with eroded soils, often near the equator in, in uh, Cocoa. Moving on, on the positive news, um, I'm now talking uh, to um, friends, old friends in Pakistan with Asian Development Bank. Think about rice husk. Another very dry agricultural waste product, thousands and thousands of tons. Uh, some of the African middle class are increasingly eating rice and maybe less cassava. So there's, there's regional differences. But if you think of rice husk, fantastic. It can also be used. So all the um, developing countries with NDCs or with um, a need for heating or drying, it can be used in this case with biochar, but also with other technologies that are already there. And um, I hope I didn't forget, I can look in my little notes here, um, the applications. It's so rich um, that just this little tiny, wonderful nature-based solution can provide. Um, mentioned the gas, we built this plant. So it's now complete. The picture here. Uh, first, uh, is not more used neither in, in Europe or in, in Africa in this case, or Latin America, if you think core. Second uh, observation um, is the one I opened with. There's very limited uh, um, equity or, or grant money to say, hey, let's decarbonize the agricultural supply chain in combination with cook stoves and rainforests, for example, because it's a bit more complex and because it may need the issue of, let's say green bonds, and then the donors have to split the brain and say, oh, so it's a financial sector innovation and technology transfer at the same time for renewable power or adaptation mitigation mechanisms. So we, um, I'll give you another example. We have one company that would love to deploy that technology. It's a project developer. And uh, I had a few talks with European Investment Bank and European Investment Fund. And we came up with the idea uh, to say, why is the private sector not offering to do all the project development first to show it can be done. Not everybody will be able to do it, but you know, with our company, with Econex, we would do that. So we would say, here's a project that is feasible. It is discussed with Christopher. Everybody loves it. Let's go to Liberia and deploy it. This one in Hamburg costs 
close to 5 million euros. So it's not, not that much money. It's not a large hydropower plant that's central and then you build kilometers of uh, transmission lines. This would be an, an energy and agricultural hub uh, that is self-sufficient. So what we run into the problem is people either say, ah, is it really proven technology? Ah, why is nobody using it yet? So that's a typical DFI answer. It's under their statutes. So one could change the statutes. Um, or they may say, yeah, we can give you a loan, but you need to bring the first one or two million yourself. And then Christopher would look at me, I would look at Christopher, said, well, yeah, we can do that maybe one time, but this is not sustainable if you keep asking the most risky tranche or piece from the private sector. So what we are proposing with a few very uh, cool donors these days um, uh, that, that I think are opening up tenders uh, for, for innovation and maybe even technology transfer, um, that's where I think we feel very welcome, where we say, okay, what if we did the first step and we produced feasibility studies and started the process and then came back, let's say with Christopher or another user, maybe a local private sector, an SME, can we get the funding then for sure? And that would be a breakthrough. There's no real standby facility that would say, wow, if the private sector took that risk to not be able to uh, develop the project, maybe the site is not okay. Uh, we would like to benefit that kind of development work with a steady flow of funding that is you know, very stringent and yes, it will have to follow the rules and the IFC performance standards. And we would, in our case, even bring ILO along from Geneva just to make sure that we have just transition and um, uh, labor standards are complied with. We haven't found that party yet. It's quite astonishing. Even with that offer to go first and not charge any fees or any cash, we're not asking for any TA, it's quite astonishing that we haven't found that one donor that would say, yeah, let's do that. Uh, what's the pipeline? Let's go. Um, but on a, on a positive note, I think there is movement most, more in the donor side that I see than in the DFI side. They're probably doing their regular business very well, but I'm not sometimes not sure they have the right statutes. Uh, we, we all know in currency, for example, they are still indebting nations with dollars and euros. There's also movement on that, but there's a few things one could change. And the last one I would mention <clears throat> is uh, next to this, uh, we need uh, proven technologies, is the one where people say, is it the first of its kind project? The only program I know is one of the European Union under the old Juncker plan. Where uh, people said specifically, if that's the first time you had a private sector would love to roll it out and doesn't find a bank or another financial mechanism to go. I would see blended finance, first loss or equity, not really a grant. We would, every private sector person that would love to scale climate finance and mitigation and adaptation would have to say, and you should, you should test it, uh, we will pay it back. There is, there's gotta be some kind of a return um, if we make a charcoal, it has a local market. In this case, to power an entire chocolate factory, it's got to have a market value. We don't need the grants. It just needs to be kind of a, no problem to anywhere in the world. Oftentimes, some of these parts you can even manufacture locally. So you create lower and higher skilled labor at the, at the same time. And it's, if, you, if, if, if I close with a very boring picture, uh, the outside just needs to look like that, right? So there's nothing special. This is not anything that is not seen anywhere that I've been in the world. Um, all you need is a bit of space. Uh, there's nothing that uh, it requires an unbelievable amount of infrastructure, quite the opposite. Uh, all we need is the tons of, cocoa shells or rice husk uh, needed to get going. And I will close on that positive note. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Michael. Uh, I think it's, uh, for me, always very nice to see the concrete examples of, of technology and how it can sort of address different areas and doesn't always need to be super complex. But with that, you know, we have, we have some time left. Uh, um, uh, we took, I think, a good of time to provide you with lots of information, but now I would like to open it up 
you know, for any uh, questions, comments, reactions, uh, both on the report uh, um, that will be published shortly, but also on the points made by the discussions. So please, uh, anybody who would like to come in, and uh, I'm glad that I see a first hand by uh, my colleague Paul Horrocks to break the ice. So Paul, please come in. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the invite to this discussion. Um, so hi, I'm Paul Horrocks, I'm leading the private finance for sustainable development team at the OECD. And, and you touched a bit um, on that uh, in your last presentation um, from your colleague, uh, Michael, um, on blended finance. Um, now, from what we've seen, we think that blended finance can be a really important component in sort of helping to de-risk um, some of these technology transfers. And it's not being used quite um, as well or being picked up as much as it should. Um, I mean, there was a point about the equity uh, that can help de-risk some of these more challenging projects that require that buffer of capital to be able to, to, to get the investments to, to fly. And um, um, there are lots of examples of these sort of te te technology transfers, but you do need the equity to happen. Um, and DFIs, they've got sort of portfolios of projects so that they could sort of cross, um, cover some of the risk between the more uh, difficult, uh, um, climate uh, technology transfer type projects and, and benefit um, some of these technologies to come into developing countries and for um, a lot of the local um, entrepreneurs to, 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 to really seize the opportunity. Um, so I'm surprised that we're not seeing more of this um, uh, take up by DFIs that do have the balance sheet to be able to sort of uh, look at these projects with high risk, but then balance them across their whole portfolio where they are sort of returning quite high um, returns on some of the more stable, uh, longer term projects. Um, I mean, I think the way to look at this is, is a bit that you sort of break up the technologies into sort of more mature and look at them um, in that respect. So having venture capital, of course, for those that are a bit more immature and requiring um, um, a bit more risk to the to right to the extreme of of having uh, green social sustainable bonds that are long tenor, uh, low cost of financing, um, and that can aggregate lots of small scale projects and get institutional investors uh, interested in those. So um, looking a bit at the technology, looking how that can be brought and how DFIs can, can um, bring their knowledge in terms of risk and analysis and structuring, I think would be really important because we've got to look at fundamentally different ways if we really want to tackle some of these critical climate issues. It's no business as usual isn't going to work. And so um, you do need to have almost a sort of uh, startup venture capital to some of the technologies that are really going to do this, this, this big jump that we, that we require. Um, I mean, Global Affairs Canada um, takes more risk than their DFI. So there are examples as was made that donors take more of a sort of willingness to, 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 to put more skin in the game and more uh, development finance at risk to really crowd in and mobilize those investors that not only can bring the money, but also uh, the rigor, the sweating the projects to make sure that they do deliver and the investors do get their money back and understanding of the technology risks, uh, but also the financial risks, I think is crucial. So that, that, that's, I think, what needs to be developed in terms of uh, developing this type of uh, uh, system change, whereby DFIs, um, along with some donors, are the sort of um, incubators, facilitators for this type of technology transfer. Um, otherwise, we won't see on the ground uh, results in developing countries where there's a, there's a vast demand for this type and crying out for these types of projects and SMEs that can could use this funding. So just a, a, a sort of broad comment for me, but thank you very much for this discussion. Thanks so much, Paul, for, for coming in. Let me uh, again invite uh, others uh, in the virtual room to, you know, again, if you have any questions on, on what was presented on, on some of the data, some of the facts, some of the examples, please come in. Um, but maybe if as, as we wait, um, um, what I would... I would maybe propose to first just to um, 
you know, see if, if uh, Christopher, you want to you want to come in again and, and say, look, you know, you've talked a lot about how you developed the, uh, uh, the, the needs assessments, how that's linked to your um, to your uh, NDC program and, you know, the, the, um, the contingent uh, part of, uh, of the goals that you have of the ambition that you have there. Um, can, is there anything that you observed in sort of your counter uh, or your, your engagement with international partners and, you know, how, how res does it resonate to you what you heard maybe from, from Michael now from a sort of private investor, private sector perspective that's, uh, who's keenly interested basically to seeing uh, opportunities uh, um, to do this out, but, but also feels there's a constraint for the pickup there and, and the, the way that the system works um, uh, is not yet really super conducive to, to uh, being effective. So I don't know, Christopher, would you like to, to, uh, to come in on that again maybe or share any reflections on that? Yes, of course. Uh, can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, my low experience within uh, the few time that I've been around with, uh, with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia, um, uh, most of these uh, donors would like for for countries like ours to go for loan. And uh, governments wouldn't want to, you know, to apply on a route. They wouldn't want to, you know, to do that. And most of the time when we engage uh, most of these donors, they always uh, set up a, a, a huge uh, bureaucracy. Take for example, the GCF. The GCF uh, passes is really, really long and very complex. And our countries, especially develop, uh, developing countries like ours, do not have that uh, reconciled knowledge to even do applications. So sometimes to even develop the proposal, we have to either rely on UNDP, Conservations International, or uh, UNEP before we develop uh, proposals. And uh, that shows that, you know, we, our capacity is not even at a level to, to, you know, to get fundings. And sometimes uh, the process, some unnecessary bureaucracies are just put in place in my mind, you know, to acquire funding, to address. If all of us as, a, as people, as a global village, we see the need to address climate change, then uh, we don't need to pull the kind of bureaucracy. I'm not saying that do not put a system in place in order to monitor the funding, the flow of the funding, and whether the funding is directly being implemented. You can do that without uh, putting on necessary checkpoints to even acquiring the funds. You know, So uh, that is one key things that I've realized. And take, for example, the only country, the, the only uh, uh, organizations that is at this moment funding uh, technologies that have been assessed is the CTCN, Climate Technology Center and Network. They are the only organizations that are being in the business of you know, providing funding uh, so sometimes towards the, to, towards the deployment of these technologies that we've assessed. But even that funding is restricted. They term it as technical assistance. They do not, they do not provide the funding to countries. In fact, they gave funding to their network uh, organizations to be able to, to apply, to support the deployment of that technology. And in most cases, the cost of the technology is so high and their funding is restricted to 250,000 United States dollars. So which cannot even implement some of the least technologies in countries. So, uh, and also uh, we that, I consider the uh, TNA coordinators or we that have assessed technologies we've not been given platform like this to be able to market ourselves. Maybe there are some uh, potential funding areas elsewhere to be able to unlock that for our countries. I feel that uh, a lot is required to be done in this area, in this, in this, in this aspect as our national governments Will not have will not have money to be able to allot to address the issue of climate change. They rather they rather they rather 
they rather, you know, they rather, you know, uh, concentrate on the issues that will have them to be elected to power or to remain into the various positions than to, you know, to allot enough funding to address the issues of climate change. Uh, I, I'm always uh, very tough for my country because my country is a key example. Recently, we have the budgetary allotments. Uh, the budget is up. If you look, if you look in the budget, and look at look at what uh, is being allotted for the, uh, the 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 monitoring of the environment, the compliance and enforcement of the environment, it's it's nothing. It's nothing. It, it cannot even take care of salaries. You know, it can even uh, be able to. To, to provide our inspectors uh, a uniform to be able to monitor these processes. So at the end of the day, uh, more awareness are now also being done when it comes to the protections of our forest and also doing things that are not usual, that are not uh, environmental friendly. Uh, more to that, our, our, our people do not even understand, as we speak, our people do not understand what climate change is. And they do not even understand if you tell them, do not cut down the forest. They will tell you what is the, what is the other way around. And if you show them the other way around, uh, they you do not provide it and just leave from there. They will definitely become more independent. They want to become dependent on the forest and they will keep continue to, you know, to, to cut down our mangroves and, and, and produce, uh, and use the mangroves. So most of the time, that's one of the problems that we face. They cut down the mangroves and use the mangroves to dry fish. That's why it's usually done here. And we run after them every moment. And they'll stay. It's not that some of them are, are not in the know, but because there is no alternative measures. If we have alternative and we have uh, technologies deployed, you know, to address challenges uh, like this, I think it will be curtailed to a certain level. And that you know we will be collectively joining the world to fight the issues of climate change. That's just an intervention that I just thought to provide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. And uh, I mean, uh, as you said, uh, there there are fundamental resource challenges, obviously, that that are at the core of, of of what we see. And I think also, you know, your intervention very clearly pointed to how, at the end of the day, this is this is a development challenge, um, and what's what is required uh, is, is, you know, alternatives. And again, I think the technologies can provide some of these alternatives. And ideally, it should, you know, it should do so not just as a, as a second best, but as a first best and generate growth and, 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 uh, and investment. But with that, uh, let me just pass back very quickly to, to our presenters and then also to Michael as a second discussion and see if you have any further reactions or, or points to make from, uh, from the discussion that we had. So Lakshmi maybe, then Alberto, and then Michael. Lakshmi, Thanks. are you? Yes. Sorry, yeah, great. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think I think the discussion is already captured really well. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think just to emphasize the point again that this is obviously a challenge at multiple levels, right? I mean, also when it comes to specific countries, we know that certain capacities exist, certain don't, and also the same to which technologies are also mature to be absorbed within specific countries. So there is some level, what we try to aggregate or try to show is the, the aggregation of technologies according to the market maturity and diffusion overall, but it also differs extremely when it comes to from context to context. Um, and, and I guess that's the key point I want to leave everybody with. Thank you. Many thanks, Lakshmi. So again, the, the, obviously the centrality of context specificity. Um, Alberto, any, uh, any closing reflections from your side? Um, maybe just very quickly, uh, I think what was clear for, from, from the interaction we had is that uh, I think something that is really critical is really to connect the country needs and the, the way in which 
uh, you know, uh, development agencies and DFIs work and their business models. Uh, so I think there uh, there is a lot of work to do. And uh, I think, you know, today's discussion was probably uh, really uh, enlightening uh, in, in that regard. Uh, but I think uh, for me, that, that was it. So over to Michael, he has, if he has anything to add. Thanks, Thanks Alberto. Alberto. So Michael, for you to conclude, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Jens. Um, yeah, quick one. Um, one thing that uh, resonated when Paul spoke earlier, um, I used to run three blended finance vehicles, above, a little bit above $800 million with the team. We were just a few people. And interestingly, I, I would have to lie to you, but I think it was about 80% of that money was dedicated for on lending to banks. And I'm not sure why that maybe still the case is such a big for technology transfer, I think inhibitor, because the bank locally will not never touch it. They usually don't touch long-term. They don't touch agriculture. We had a huge problem finding banks that were even willing to touch the agricultural sector at the time with the German government, with BMZ. Um, so if you continue as a donor to allow the on lending via a bank, then you run into the next complexity that Lakshmi was saying, the local bank doesn't want to touch that sector, agriculture, even though that's often 70%, at least in Africa, of the jobs, and often GDP. Um, so you may have to go direct, you may have to talk, um, what Paul was saying, to kind of more of a venture or the, the innovation directly and take that in your backpack and bring it uh, and transfer it. Because if you go via banks, then maybe your fund manager and or the local bank are your inhibitors and you're sitting there with good, uh, well-intentioned uh, donor resources and you feel, why is it not getting into the technology transfer? And with that, uh, Jens, uh, just the open uh, invitation, maybe via you or the organizers, any donors reach out uh, any time to me, more than happy to discuss and uh, talk about these uh, inhibiting factors uh, directly. Many thanks, Michael, uh, and thanks to all our participants. Uh, I mean, I think we heard this was this was a I mean, it's a very rich topic. I think it's an increasing focus. So I, I think this will be just the start of a conversation, and very much looking to continue that uh, with with uh, our contributors, our panelists, uh, our discussants, but with all of you. Um, and uh, as I said, we will shortly issue the report where you find uh, this information that was presented and and, and a good uh, bit more. And as I said, yeah, a, a critical topic. I think lots to be done, a critical role for development cooperation and hope we can work together to take it further. With that, thanks a lot to all of you and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you, bye-bye.